Good morning or afternoon, everyone. It's just about the top of the hour, so we wanted to get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Marie Latalip, and I manage some of the nutrition programs at our organization. And this series is brought to you in collaboration with the American Society for Nutrition. And what we're doing is we're exhibiting some of the latest science specifically relevant to gut microbiome, diet, and health, or some elements thereof. So this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on our website if you'd like to go back and listen to it. So for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit scientific organization. We focus on advancing science relevant to nutrition and food safety for the benefit of the health of the public. We don't do any lobbying or advocacy work, but rather we focus on the science. And how we operate is by a tripartite model, meaning that we include scientists from government, academia, and industry to address scientific issues of common interest. So we wanted to thank everyone for joining today. Our audience is reflective of the tripartite that we work with. And as usual, as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, enter them in the chat at any time, and we will get to those at the end. So with that, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jay Sung. He received his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2012. And his thesis was focused on developing systems biology approaches for clinical biomarker discovery. And after he did some postdoctoral fellowships, including at the Asia Pacific Center for Theoretical Physics in South Korea, and then later at the Harvard Medical School, then he joined the Mayo Clinic as an assistant professor. And there he runs his own computational biology research group. And this group studies the gut microbiome with the overall goal to develop novel computational tools to advance precision medicine. And then in his free time, Jay likes to bake with his family, play indoor soccer at the YMCA, and also to catch up on his favorite podcast. So it's good to know that about you, Dr. Sung. And with that, we will turn the platform over to you, and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, sounds perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ilse, uh, especially Marie, for the kind invitation to come and speak. My name is Jay Sung, and I'm an assistant professor at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So as most of you in the audience may know, uh, there's been a ton of research and investment on the gut microbiome in science, medicine, and in industry lately. And one aspect not only my research group, but also many others are trying to solve and address is, can it be predictive in regard to health and disease? Uh, today I'll be presenting one piece uh, of work from our group in understanding more about what the microbiome can tell us about health. Before I begin, I'd like to mention that the work I'll be presenting today has recently been published. This study was led by a terrific postdoc in my group, Dr. Vinod Gupta. So for those wanting to know the full details of our work, uh, please either read the paper or feel free to uh, reach out to uh, me or Vinod. Okay, so the gut microbiome, or sometimes called the gut microbiota, is basically the collection of trillions or so of microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, and archaea, that technically speaking reside in our entire GI tract but most often referred to those that dwell in our large intestine. As many in the audience will know, uh, the gut microbiome has strong influence on almost every aspect of human biology. Here on the left, um, I provided a few examples where the gut microbiome has been shown to play a significant role in human physiology. Now it's widely considered that when the population of microorganisms is disrupted, thereby leading to certain pathways and modules going wrong, then the result can lead to an assortment of diseases, such as the one listed on the right. As a brief side note, I've been making this list since I began studying the microbiome, um, the gut microbiome, oh, um, some six or seven years ago. And back then, I'd say that what was widely known at the time was probably the top half or maybe the top third on this list on the left. But now there's a lot more connections that have been made and this list continues to expand. And for diseases, back at the time, only associations, uh, anecdotal evidence, um, and mere hunches or hypotheses were only available. Now, many of these pathologies have been either confirmed through large population scale studies or experimentally validated in disease animal models. 
So given this pace, it's really interesting to think about how much uh, further we'll know in another six or seven years. Anyway, back to the main point. Now, although many of the uh, gut microbiomes uh, related to this particular related to these particular diseases have been studied individually against healthy controls, the question of what a gut microbiome that encompasses all diseases could look like, and thereby basically investigating a generalizable non-healthy gut microbiome, or basically what it's not supposed to look like normally, has not been widely considered uh, despite the um, uh, profound significance. Seemingly related to this topic, an interesting meta-analysis came out from uh, Eric Alms lab back at MIT, uh, at MIT back in 2017, where they found that gut microbiome signatures can be shared across multiple studies and even multiple diseases. First, I'm showing on the left uh, three heat maps, each corresponding to a particular disease, uh, where rows are bacteria, columns are independent studies investigating the respective disease. Remember, this is a meta-analysis or research on other people's research. In this case, obesity, colorectal cancer, and CDI, or Clostridium difficile infection. The darker the red means that the bacteria was higher in disease, and the darker the green means the bacteria was higher in controls. As you can see by comparing across columns for um, particular bacteria, bacteria was either high or was found to be either high or low in disease consistently across studies, showing some reasonable amount of reproducibility in disease-associated uh, gut microbiome signatures. What was really interesting is what the authors found next. Uh, bacteria whose abundance patterns were commonly observed across multiple diseases. So on the heat map on the right, the columns are now bacteria, with the bars indicating whether the bacteria was seen across two or more diseases, hence non-specific to a disease or unique, or, or unique to a single disease. As you can see on the top row here, there are many bacteria that are consistent, either up or down, across multiple diseases, hence non-specific to a particular disease. But towards the bottom, you can see gut microbiome signatures found in only one disease. So there are indeed several bacteria that are uh, disease specific. Now their observation that gut microbiome signatures can be shared across multiple uh, pathologies uh, led, led us to wonder the following. Can we identify gut microbiome signatures of disease irrespective or independent of the clinical diagnosis and use this signature to design a stool-based test that predicts health, or in our study, uh, predicts how likely you are to have a disease or not. By no means is this any type of esoteric question. Rather, it's, if successfully demonstrated, this idea could be useful in the following. Say a patient walks into the clinic for a routine checkup, gets his normal blood work done to look at fasting blood glucose levels, cholesterol, et cetera, and then integrated into this checkup would be a gut microbiome test showing you not only what species or strains are up or down, but also any signs of something being potentially off. Actually, if you talk to clinicians, uh, at least where I work, they get asked all the time by their patients on how they can learn more about their microbiome, how it relates to overall health. So definitely a niche for this type of work exists. Okay, uh, but where do we start? So this is a very simple infographic I bring up with my colleagues who aren't familiar with the details of the biomarker discovery plus machine learning type of work our group does. Oftentimes people think that analyzing large-scale biomolecular so-called omics data sets uh, entails a bunch of coding and data parsing. Although there are some elements of truth to this, rather the majority of the time is actually spent on getting good quality training data or discovery cohort or the discovery cohort necessary for the machine algorithm software to learn something new and useful. Afterwards of getting this training data or essentially the search space we'll be working with, we can then focus our efforts on the experimenting and coding, which will involve feature selection, um, model selection, and model optimization and parameterization. So first let me explain how we obtain the training data. Fortunately, all the data we need is actually available free in public data repositories. Uh, shown here is a slide um, in our, of our pipeline on how we pulled together gut microbiome data from previously published studies. So quickly to mention what's going on is uh, we did a survey of published studies on human um, stool metagenomes. We started off with 55 studies, uh, close to 7,600 samples. We removed some uh, studies, entire studies, based on our um, inclusion criteria. Um, and then uh, we did some quality control on the sequence reads, removed some samples, uh, did um, uh, taxonomic profiling uh, using a commonly used tool um, and then we remove some faulty or outlier looking samples and then we uh, remove some additional studies and this is all de described in, in, in detail in the paper but in summary um, we started 
from a collection of, of over 7,500 stool metagenome samples pulled from, uh, well, from 55 independent studies. And after excluding some studies and samples using a strict uh, series of a uh, using a series of strict criteria, the final training data was um, a pooled metadata set of uh, 4,347 stool metagenome or gut microbiome samples from 34 independent published studies ranging across 13 phenotypes. As shown in the table, these 13 phenotypes include um, 2,636 samples from healthy subjects. Uh, here, healthy was defined as self-reported to not having a disease or disease-related uh, symptoms. And of course, depending on who you ask, their definition of healthy can be a bit different. It's one of those ambiguous terms like intelligence, creativity, et cetera, that don't, doesn't really have a strict definition. Uh, but we need, you know, but we need to, for, for the analysis, uh, we need to draw the, the line in the sand somewhere. So in our study, healthy means no disease or overt symptoms. Also, there were uh, seven, so 1,711 um, 1, samples from non-healthy subjects. Here, non-healthy subjects were actually patients with one of 12 different disease or abnormal body weight conditions. These 12 non-healthy phenotypes include cardiovascular disease, colon cancer, Crohn's disease, also colitis, obesity, type 2 diabetes. One thing to note here is that we actually downloaded all the microbiome samples as raw pre-processed sequence files and uniformly ran our in-house bioinformatics pipeline since we're pulling microbiome data from various studies. This uniform, this type of uniform bioinformatics processing is really important for we're getting rid of, rid of as much batch effects as possible, although we acknowledge it's impossible to eliminate entirely. So again, this entire study was driven by publicly available data. So a big, so big thanks uh, needed to go out to all the labs that generated and posted the microbiome data sets with no strings attached for big data, uh, data scientists and computational biologists like us to do whatever we want with it. Uh, surely it feels like um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, as Isaac Newton would say. So this is, a, this is showing what plotting uh, 4,347 microbiome samples looks like uh, projected simultaneously in a two-dimensional space. And this is just a pr um, commonly used uh, principal coordinate analysis. Um, and as you can see, each point here uh, represents a sample, one out of uh, this collection of microbiomes. Blue is the non-healthy, orange is, I'm sorry, blue is the healthy, uh, and orange is the non-healthy. And looking into this a little bit in closer detail, we projected all the, um, the non-healthy phenotypes here. So the blue, you know, blue and blue is, is still healthy here. But then you get to look at a, another, um, a finer level of granularity where you get to see all these uh, phenotypes um, simultaneously. So this is kind of, you know, this is just a pr projection of all the, the samples we have. Okay, so now going back to the previous slide, uh, across all these samples, we found 785 microbial species observed to be present in at least one sample. Of note, uh, our entire analysis was performed at the species level to get to the finest level of taxonomic precision while still maintaining a reasonable amount of comprehensivity. We decided to investigate the species a bit, mainly by plotting a histogram of prevalences of all of these 785 species. Here, species prevalence is simply defined as the proportion of all 4,347 samples where the species is observed to exist. A prevalence of 100% means that the species is present in all samples. 50% means that the species is found in only half of the entire samples. And a prevalence of zero means that the species is present in none uh, samples. As you can see on the far left, the majority of the species is present in very small fraction of samples, and there is a skewed distribution, distribution towards the right. This means that prevalence across samples varies widely depending on the microbial species. Now, this is not really new news, and we're basically uh, confirming what others have previously found, but just on a much larger metagenomic data set in regard to sample size. Looking into this further, we found that more than half of the 785 species were rarely observed. Um, and then we have over 300 species that vary almost uniformly in their prevalences. Interestingly, we found uh, six microbial species that are prevalent in over 90 prevalent in over 90% of samples. It's important to keep in mind that these six species are prevalent regardless of health or disease state. So we conjecture that these are possibly core species of the gut microbiome indicated to us by actual data from thousands of microbiome samples. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about the training data we'll use to uh, develop our gut microbiome health indicator. Next is to find which species are associated with health and which species are associated with disease. Okay, so uh, to explain how we'll do so, I like to use the, the following analogy. Um, on one side of the screen, you have an environment that is teeming with life, fresh air, 
good overall ecosystem, but on the other, you have an environment full of waste, toxicity, and definitely not where you want to go hiking or swimming. Obviously, the healthy environment is the one on the left. If you think about it, uh, in the good ecological environment, you have life forms that are much more prevalent than in the bad environment. But one important point that should not be overlooked is that the bad ecosystem on the right is not void of life. Actually, on the contrary, there are definitely life forms in this bad environment that are much more abundant compared to the good environment. So in other words, scarcely seen in the good environment. If we were to quantify this concept and adopt it for our own purposes, we can term the microbial species that are more frequently observed in healthy subjects as health prevalent. You can also term the microbial species that are less frequently observed in healthy as health scarce. So we have two important terms here, health prevalent and health scarce, microbial species. Um, again, health prevalent species can be assumed to be associated with healthy state, and these health scarce species can be assumed to be associated with non-healthy state. Here's some data to further illustrate what I mean. We have a list of bacterial species um, here, uh, how often they're found in the 2,636 healthy samples, how often these bacteria are found in the 1,711 non-healthy samples, uh, or those having a disease, and, a difference between these two, and the difference between these two prevalences and the full change. In the table at the top, uh, we show the top five healthy associated species rank ordered based on how more often they're found um, in non-healthy relative to healthy. You can see that at the top, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, you show that uh, uh, how more often they're found in and healthy relative to non-healthy. Some of you may recognize here the Bifidobacterium adolescens, uh, adolescentis, which is a known probiotic. In the bottom table, we show the top five non-healthy as associated species rank ordered based on how more often they're found in non-healthy relative to healthy. You can see that at the top, uh, these are mostly Clostridia and Ruminococcus species. So in summary, we have a prevalence-based strategy to identify species associated with phenotype, which is, which is basically about taking into account the frequency of a signal. Importantly, the identification of uh, these healthy and non-healthy associated species, or the species prevalent and, and scarce and healthy, was found using a top-down strategy purely from the training data, and not like a bottom-up approach where we first assume something to be there and then try going after it. On a side note, one question you can ask here is that, um, as its result, uh, especially for the uh, health associated microbial species, uh, comes from uh, looking at over 4,000 people. Are these health associated species the ones we should really be focusing on as a probiotic? Anyway, now the next question is how do we use these health prevalent and health scare species to predict health or disease? Now, we, sh now we actually have multiple uh, pages in our paper explaining how we derived and implemented a mathematical formula to predict health and disease, but due to time, I'll briefly describe the main idea in the following. In our view, the most intuitive and straightforward way to estimate whether a microbiome sample is either healthy or non-healthy is to simply find the ratio of the collective abundance of health prevalent species to, to the collective uh, abundance of health scare species. And if we put a log on this ratio, um, and here's the really important point, then um, any output that is positive means higher collective abundance in the numerator or in the health uh, prevalent species, meaning healthy. But on the other hand, any output that is negative means a higher you know, uh, number uh, in the denominator, or it means higher collective abundance of health scare species, meaning non-health. Okay, so, po so a positive score means healthy, a negative score means non-health. Okay. Uh, now this collective abundance psi is basically a slightly modified version of the geometric mean, which is a reasonable metric to find expected values in microbiome data, given that this relative abundance, given that the relative abundances of microbiome data span several orders of magnitude, after doing the math, um, you'll be able to find that this version of the mean takes into account the presence or absence of each species within the group, uh, the cumulative relative um, abundance, and the diversity of those species. And this is all derived in the, in the paper. So now moving forward, uh, based on whatever prevalence cutoffs uh, you select, you can have many combinations of or sets of health prevalent and health scare species. Next, after identifying systematically all possible species sets, we plug each of them in into our formula to test model accuracy. Here, accuracy is basically how accurately we predict healthy subjects to be healthy and non-healthy subjects to be non-healthy. After looking at all accuracies, the best set of features, um, that is the two sets of microbial species and the parameter tuned model is what we use as the gut microbiome health index, which I'll be calling the GMHI for short for the rest of this presentation. Here's a table from the main manuscript showing the 50 microbial species we found to best separate healthy from non-healthy. Uh, seven of these species here at the top 
are um, the health prevalent and the remaining 43 are the health scare, uh, scare species. Now I know the text in the table is very small, but I'd like to point out that some of the health prevalent species here at the top are actually marketed probiotics, uh, providing some evidence that these probiotics are indeed associated with health. Okay, so I just went over how we obtained the training data, how we identified the microbes at the species level associated with healthy and non-healthy, and how we designed the mathematical formula that can be used as a classifier to distinguish a microbiome sample as either healthy, which is no disease, or non-healthy, which is having disease. So what do our results look like? First, we differentiate the two major groups, which are the healthy and the non-healthy group. In this violin plot, we're showing the GMHI distributions of both groups, where the GMHI scores are shown on the y-axis. As I previously mentioned, a positive um, GMHI means predicted as healthy, and negative GMHI means predicted as non-healthy. In this way, we get a balanced accuracy of 69.9%, or basically 70%. This balanced accuracy is calculated by taking the proportion of healthy samples we classify correctly and the proportion, so proportion of healthy samples we classify correctly, so everything positive here, and the proportion of uh, non-healthy samples we, correct, we classify correctly, so negative, so all the guys here in the negative, and just take the average. The best you can do is 100%, the worst you can do is 0%. The statistical significance of the difference between both distribution is an insanely low p-value, and the effect size of the separation, which we use the Cliffs Delta, to calculate is 0.56. Briefly, uh, for those who don't know, Cliffs Delta is a rank-based non-parametric uh, procedure, which goes well with the man whitney u test. Uh, having a magnitude closer to one uh, generally means a better, more consistent separation between the groups. Okay. In addition, we broke down the non-healthy group into its 12 subclasses. Uh, here, healthy is still in here, but just crunched on the sides a bit. The stars on the top, uh, uh, the top of each of the 12 non-healthy subclasses indicate a significant difference uh, with the corresponding phenotype to healthy. Here, 11 of the 12 show significant separation. So, um, but to truly appreciate and utilize GMHI, we need to consider it as a continuous variable uh, rather than considering it at, as uh, black and white absolutes. Um, let me explain. So in the plot in the middle of the screen, we're binning all 4,347 samples into bins of GMHI. On the left, and right, you have the two extremes. In one bin, you have people whose GMHIs are either from four to six, positive four to positive six. In the bin on the other side, you have people whose GMHIs are from minus four to minus six. In between these bins, you have samples binned in a stepwise fashion leading to both ends. The points on the blue line, uh, shown here, indicate proportion of samples of each bin that are actually healthy. Points on the orange line, uh, indicate proportion of samples in each bin that are actually non-healthy. So the take-home message here is that your GMHI is uh, here is that as as your GMHI is more positive or more negative, the higher the confidence we have in the prediction accuracy. So the closer and the closer your GMHI is to zero, which indicates an equal balance of healthy prevalent and um, oh, health prevalent and health scare species, the less confident we are in whether you have a disease or not. So perhaps this point can be explained further uh, using ordination plots. So here, when we plot all 4,347 samples into this uh, PCOA or principal coordinates analysis plot I showed earlier, we show that healthy, we see that healthy and non-healthy samples merge, pr pretty much merge onto each other, showing not so good separation. But what if we only look at the most healthy samples of the healthy group and the most non-healthy samples of the non-healthy group? We see that if we look at the top 10, top 25, top 50 to top 100, uh, most healthy and non-healthy samples based upon their GMHIs, we actually get pretty good separation. This shows that GMHI is actually a decent way to stratify healthy and non-healthy groups if we consider the actual index values rather than looking for only positive and negative. But how does GMHI do compared to other metrics? So this is not a very straightforward, to straightforward question to answer as there is no other gut microbiome-based metric specific, at least that I'm aware of in the literature specifically designed to tell you about health. So uh, just for comparison purposes, we just use what's commonly used in the e ecology literature, mainly um, Shannon uh, diversity, uh, species richness, and 80% abundance coverage, which is basically the minimum number of species you, knew, you need to compose at least 80% of the total abundance of microbes in a sample. Um, I'd like to direct your focus to the Cliffs deltas, or the effect sizes I had mentioned earlier. 
as you can see from the small letter Ds in the four violin plots, um, GMHI has the highest magnitude, where being closer to one um, in magnitude indicates the stronger separation uh, between the, uh, the two uh, subject groups, healthy and normal. Okay, uh, looking, at, looking into this a little further, um, on each of these scatter plots here, uh, we compare GMHI head-to-head -head with each ecological metric. Each point um, corresponds to a sample. The x-axis uh, plots each ecological metric, um, and the y-axis plots GMHI. If you compare the distribution on the x-axis to that on the y-axis, so again, the x-axis here is the di uh, distribution of, of healthy and non-healthy of the respective ecological metric, and the y-axis is uh, the, the two distributions of healthy and non-healthy of GMHI. Um, so basically, the, 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 uh, you can see that GMHI always separates healthy from non-healthy better than, than any other parameter. So up to now, I hope I've convinced you that GMHI can separate uh, healthy from non-healthy and, um, and much better so, so than other indices. But really, the gold standard of any biomarker or health disease indicator is how well it performs on an independent validation set, that is, a data set not previously seen during the model training process. Okay, so here we show our GMHI results on 679 microbiome samples from nine additional studies. On the left, um, we show the results when asked to classify between the two groups of healthy and non-healthy. As before, the blue and orange distributions are for healthy and non-healthy respectively, and the y-axis uh, shows the GMHI scores. Uh, this time, we get a balanced accuracy of 73.7% and an eclipse delta of 0.64. This was really encouraging as we actually did better here than, G than when GMHI was tested on the training set, where accuracy was 69.9% and Cliff's Delta was 0.56. So this shows that, our, uh, that the overall reproducibility and robustness of GMHI is quite good. Now on the right, we show uh, GMHI distributions for each class or phenotype of each independent study. As you can see, the three healthy, we had uh, three healthy cohorts shown in blue, all score um, these distributions all score mostly positive, and the majority of the non-blue, non-healthy subclasses score mostly negative. Going from left to right, we've shown that the GMHI distributions for ankylosing uh, spolonditis, which is a chronic inflammatory condition of the spinal cord, colorectal adenoma, and three cohorts of colorectal cancer, uh, Crohn's disease, liver cirrhosis, um, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. So what's really interesting here is that is really, uh, in particular, that liver cirrhosis and fatty uh, liver disease, both disease, diseases of the liver, uh, were not seen in the previous training process with 4,300 plus samples, showing that perhaps GMHI can lightly be extended beyond the diseases and organ, system, organ systems it was trained upon. This is really cool because now we can uh, begin to wonder whether we captured elements of a universal gut microbiome uh, disease signature. Next, we show uh, how well the other metrics, Shannon diversity, 80% abundance coverage, and richness do on these validation sets. So again, uh, drawing your attention to the, um, uh, to the effect sizes, uh, compare uh, 0.64 uh, to, uh, to the effect size in Shannon diversity, 80% abundance coverage, and species richness. We do a lot better. And um, you could look at um, these distributions of these individual cohorts. We can see that actually when it comes to I'll just mention these um, these blue cohorts here, which are all healthy. You can see that you know this guy here for Shannon diversity scores more on the negative side here and here as well. And there's a significant distribution between a significant difference between this guy and this guy and this healthy cohort and this healthy cohort in all these ecological um, metrics. We don't see that in GMHI, and this is all validation data. Um, and you can make whatever com similar conclusions um, on. Um, on these uh, disease uh, cohorts as well, but I won't go through in detail due to um, uh, limitations in time. But anyway, the main message here is that we explained this, uh, and we explained this carefully in the manuscript, but uh, GMHI outperforms uh, other metrics by a really wide margin in regards to both accuracy and consistency. So uh, one of the interesting questions we got during the review process is, okay, so we see that GMHI you know, it's an indicator of health, but does it really associate with or correlate with any type of known clinical markers? And, um, and what we mean here by clinical markers is, let's say, um, back to the blood work uh, discussion, that, uh, top, uh, discussion blood work point that I was talking about, like fasting blood glucose, uh, high-density lipoprotein, 
uh, low density LDL, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, um, uh, fasting blood glucose levels, you know, etc. Um, so we actually, with the data uh, that we that that was um, shown, um, that was provided in the um, data sets, we found that um, GMHI is associated with uh, high density lipoprotein cholesterol. So we do find a you know, a weakly moderate but significant um, uh, correlation with HDLC in the blood and gut microbiome health index. So that's that's good. Um, and uh, as many of you know, the higher the, you know, it, it, so basically the common mantra is, there's not a lot of science to back this up, but the common mantra is that um, it, the higher levels of HDLC um, means um, you have a you're more you're, you have a lower risk of heart disease and other cardiovascular uh, disease related um, related symptoms. So basically, we found that HDLC higher HDLC means high um, GMHI and low HDLC means low GMHI. Um, we also uh, look at the distributions of uh, HDLC concentrations in the um, GMHI positive people or GMHI negative people. We found that there, that GMHI does actually um, separate the two uh, groups uh, based on HDLC. So, so that was interesting. Um, so uh, last but not least, I'd like to um, uh, bring your attention to some questions I've been frequently getting in regards to our work. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have the same questions, so let's get them out of the way. Um, so a common question we're asked is, uh, did you look at microbiome function? Yes, uh, we did. Um, and uh, looking at microbiome function, especially if you're working with, um, with metagenomic data, not 16S data, it's something um, that you should look at. Um, long story short, uh, we didn't get a good separation, as good separation compared to species level uh, uh, taxonomic clades. So we did look at microbiome function, but really didn't get good separation, um, um, good separation accuracy. Um, and also, did you look at subspecies strains? We didn't because um, in our view, and this is debatable, but um, bioinformatics methods out there um, to really look at strain to for strain level identification unbiasedly, comprehensively, and quantitatively, like looking at relative abundances, um, is not really well developed in our view. And of course, uh, brilliant you know people out there may debate this, but in our view, we didn't think looking at strain. I, we don't think it's ready. Strain level techniques aren't really ready for this, so we decided to just stop at the species level. And that's what we want to do. We want to have the highest level of precision and what kind of taxonomies may be indicating of health. Um, did you control for diet, medication, uh, ethnicity, race, gender, et cetera? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of this information is actually not available. Um, now more and more studies do report um, this type of uh, information. But man, like anywhere from studies three to four years ago or more, they didn't really do a good job in reporting this. And we actually found that um, not a lot of studies report this, so we couldn't really do this population level um, uh, study that we we did and also it really depends on what you mean by controlling like if you mean controlling for a certain diet with a certain medication within a certain ethnicity in a certain gender that's really limiting putting too many constraints on the sample size and basically you won't get any population level insight um, also why not do this for a particular disease well so let's say for colorectal cancer well um, you know our interest was really looking at whether there's there's a disease or not not it, whether you have colorectal cancer or not and the reason why we didn't think that was necessary is well, I mean, there's brilliant, you know, clinicians out there that can actually that can do the diagnosis and find colorectal cancer, or do the, that diagnosis and find it's type two diabetes. So rather than sticking with okay, what can we separate case and control? We were just interested in can you separate disease at all, uh, or spot disease at all? A uh, number of disease populations is limited, so we had um, 12 uh, disease or abnormal body weight conditions, um, and uh, the reason why we stopped there is just, just that's because how much data was available at the time, um, and if there's more, uh, we would have we, we would have done so. Uh, why invent another algorithm when there's brilliant, uh, like for example, the the ratio of GMHI? Um, I think that's that's what this, this question about. Why invent another algorithm when there's uh, machine learning techniques like random forest or neural nets? Um, we actually did random forest, and and so surprisingly, the random forest did really well on um, uh, on the train data. But actually bombed um, around like 50, like 50 percent accuracy in the independent validation set. So a classic a case of um, of uh, overfitting. And also you can't really interpret um, you know how random forests and um, neural networks work 
um, and we want to have a really simple explain, explain, um, simple to explain metric. So, you, so for example, if you have a high GMHI, you know exactly what's what health prevalent species are being detected compared to health scare species. Like, like try debugging a neural net. You can't really do that. Okay, um, accuracy is only 70 to 74 percent. How is this test reliable? Well, um, that's a good point. But you know, con considering that this is um, the first generation of many to come, we think that this is actually a good starting point. Again, this is a starting point. We're not saying that this is ready for prime time. And also, we're not saying that people should be using this now. Um, if they would like to, they, they sure can. But um, I mean, like, we're trying to look for spot disease in the first place. And, you know, this is like the first, uh, I believe, the first test based on purely microbiome. Think of the question here. Like, you're looking at a stool sample. And, making a prediction whether you could have a disease or not um so you know we thought this was uh, this is a, actually a very difficult question so we think this is not ideal but it can be a lot better that we have ways to make this better and i think we think it's a good starting point i mean remember when cell phones first came out remember the, the nokia uh cell phone <laughs> when it first came out in the uh early 2000s i mean no one was com was complaining that oh you can't you can't take photos or you can't do snapchat or you can't you know uh, tweet on it, you know, so like um, uh, Yeah, there's there's many ways to improve this so we think it's a good start. There's no clinical action So again, um, you know, it's not to tell you what to do after you find a disease It's more of whether there could be a disease or not. It's independent of the clinical diagnosis. Yeah, so get, getting that out of the way um, So in summary, uh, we designed a stool based test that looks at your microbiome to predict the likelihood of having a disease this, this is really important because if you think about it, cancer, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndromes, they don't have, happen overnight. Rather, these diseases take years or even decades to develop inside yourself, right? So if we can look at your gut microbiome and detect something off about, your, about you early or um, prior to the onset of major symptoms, which is when you're really in trouble since it becomes much harder to reverse well-progressed disease course, uh, do we then have a potential tool to screen for the pre-disease state? So to develop our index, we use shotgun stool metagenome, uh, metagenomes pulled from independent uh, studies. GMHI is basically a log ratio uh, form formula, balancing the collective abundances of two sets of species. One set of species found uh, more frequently in healthy compared to non-healthy, and another set of species found less frequently in healthy than in non-healthy. Uh, GMHI outperforms methods adopted from ecological principles in both training and validation data sets. And we believe our study um, paves the path forward to track, understand, and predict human health through non-invasive approaches. So to bring everything to full circle, I'd like to reintroduce the clinical setting or, the, or possibly the consumer scenario in which this tool may provide the best utility. Because at the end of the day, we want to be users of our own tools. So on top of a report that provides the high-level taxonomies you have or, or nation plots describing beta diversities, or in addition to a report on alpha diversity, which I've shown above that GMHI does a lot better, uh, or a report on so-called bad species, which any infectious disease or GI doc can tell you that you should not be having in the first place, or to complement reports on what functions your microbiome has or does not have, or rather providing some ambiguous score that no consumer will ever know how it was conce conceived, uh, I imagine having a score uh, or index which you know exactly how it was developed and, and what it's measuring, that you can track at any moment in time, gives you some intuition of whether you have a disease independent of the clinical diagnosis, allows you to compare yourself to others in the population, and even track your GMHI over time uh, to see how well you respond after a dietary or other lifestyle intervention. Plus, you know, it's kind of fun to quantify and monitor things about yourself, and perhaps even have a friendly competition with friends or family members, like an equivalent of fantasy football, but for your gut microbiome health. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And in case there is anyone in the audience interested in working together to further develop this tool to the next step, because I'm really interested in translating this into the real world, uh, say incorporating GMHI into current gut microbiome reports or consumer products, or making a uh, 2.0 version with more samples, diseases, ethnicities, races, or, 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 races, or even a uh, 16S RNA um, gene ampicon version, or moving this type of work into specific contexts, such as a test for colon cancer, a specific autoimmune disorder, uh, looking at stratification and progression of disease, or even trying this out on any type of intervention study or clinical trial, or even some type of um, uh, changes in dietary regimen, nutrition regimen. Um, so uh, if you're interested, uh, please send me an email and I'd be happy to discuss.
So before I end, I'd like to acknowledge my fantastic group at Mayo Clinic, especially Vinod, uh, especially, uh, who's in the middle here, who led this amazing work, and also my generous funding sources, uh, without whom um, that, that took a risk on me um, on this particular project, uh, and without whom um, would most likely not having, uh, this project would not have come to fruition. Uh, and last, if there is anyone in the audience soon to be looking for postdoctoral positions, and you like the way we do science, please reach out. Uh, we're always on the lookout for excellent and ambitious talent. So uh, now by going back to our take home message slide, I'll stop here and uh, take any questions. Thank you so much for your attention.